Oh, hello and good afternoon. I welcome you to today's Trading Spotlight webinar on uh, blue chip companies, how and why to invest in them. Um, my name is Jens and uh, I'm not just a professional trader. I'm also here the moderator of today's topic. And uh, I just hope that um, we will have some fun together, let's say. At the end, I can assure you, I will share my top three high dividend yield blue chip stocks. Uh, even though right now, most likely, I think uh, you probably have wondered, do I have an opinion on the recent Coinbase IPO with a market cap of 100 billion um, with the first print? Um, I have I have one, yes, but this is not the topic of today's webinar. But I, um, I um, would say, uh, please uh, check out the chat box right now. Or if you're watching this on YouTube now, um, first of all, don't forget to subscribe. Don't uh, forget to leave a thumb up here. Um, and uh, I also um, um, uh, would like to uh, you to check out the description box of the webinar. You will find, or uh, of the video, in case of YouTube, respectively, the chat box right now on the live event, uh, because there you will have a link which directs you over to the website from Admirals, um, where you have a chance to see um, uh, some input, some some information around the Coinbase IPO, and that you via the Invest Solution from Admirals can trade Coinbase, the stock physically in fact already and um so that's that's how we want to um, um or what what i want to to give you um here in terms of coinbase recent ipo probably hottest topic uh this week but today our topic will be on blue chip companies and um i want to give you some some further details on uh, why it's worth to have a, um, a deeper give it a deeper look here in fact and probably mm, not really sure, but um, you have probably seen the recent developments yesterday, retail sales in the US shooting through the roof. Um, month on month, I think we had a growth of slightly below 10%, which is most likely due to the uh, developments around the uh, STEMIs, the uh, stimulus checks, which were provided from the US government um, one month earlier. So spending shoots up. But the thing is that this is usually a sign that um, from an econ ec economic perspective, things are probably not that bright. And uh, that being said, I mean, while we certainly have um, um, a quite strong um, Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I just checked the. I just checked the. Um, uh, I just checked the uh, chat box. So I appear like jelly. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> is that is it good or not? Um, okay. So I, I just stay the same, right? Do not move. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> That's funny. Um, no. Come back to the uh, to the current growth company outlook and growth companies. In fact, um, so they usually uh, prefer um, um, an environment where you see um, uh, positive. Um, how can we say positive economic outlook, growth um, perspective, um, low yield environment where capital flows into these growth companies. But the thing is that um, the the current signs are um, more and more appearing that there's probably uh, rather sooner than later um, uh, negative impact uh, we will see on the economy in general. And uh, that brings blue chip companies and gr not growth, but value stocks, especially in play as not just from a dividend perspective, but also from a um, um, wealth, um, very, I'm sorry, preservance um, uh, um, perspective. And this is exactly why today's topic is in fact hot. It's not just um, I'm an evergreen topic, but it's in fact a hot topic, which is of, um, of interest certainly for the upcoming um, months. And now let me share my screen. Um, so we want to do the following. We want to go here right through the um, agenda first. Before we go through the agenda, by the way, it's important to uh, give um, um, a short recap. Some of you might wonder, um, Admirals, Admirals, that was Admiral Markets before. So what happened there? Well, there's a rebranding currently taking place. Um, so with Admirals, you have a true multi-asset broker, a broker which is not just focusing on CFD and FX trading and here the leverage products, CFDs in this context, um, which are used then for um, speculative purposes at first um, uh, a glance or respectively from from a pure trading perspective, but the company is um, growing and uh, thus they, they um, decided to rebrand under Admirals and offering more financial services. And uh, thus this um, rebranding currently taking place. So 
admiral markets is now becoming admirals and so just that you do not um feel irritated or something still you have the full um range of offered products um uh, say well one of the probably biggest fx and cfd brokers um and and one with the highest reputation in fact um out there, you have um, a broad range of, of tradable assets, but also from a multi-broker asset perspective. Now, physical stocks, which is already um, which which you had available before the rebranding took place, and now in addition to that, for example, there's now a credit card, and there will be more and more financial products being offered to the uh, broader audience over time. So, admirals.com for further information on that um, on the website. But now, let's move over here to our agenda today. And in this context, focus on the points we want to we wanna make a topic today. Let me just check, by the way, here. Do I have? Let me just see. OK. Um, so first of all, what we want to, what we certainly do is we want to define what is a blue chip company. And uh, then we want to um, nearly directly um, move on to characteristics, classic characteristics of blue chips. And then um, answer the question on how to trade blue chip companies. Well, you might probably found out yourself. Well, it's a, it's a stock uh, in this context we look at. So it's like stock trading in general. But still, based on the characteristics, what a conclusion can we draw out of this? What we want to do then is we also want to um, have a look at so-called arist dividend aristocrats. Um, so what this is and, and, and why, especially in this context here for European companies, this um, ETF, the uh, Spider S&P Euro Dividend Aristocrats U6 ETF is um, of interest. This is um, what we want to uh, give some details on here and, and at this point then. And then we also want to give some key metrics you should look at once you look at dividend stocks. So it's not just a high dividend yield, but um, you should probably, um, yeah, Think about this in in more depth before um, thinking about an investment longer term, um, especially. And then at the end of the presentation, I will give you an overview of my high dividend yield blue chip top three. Um, I'd um, um, consider to be worth giving it a deeper look and then probably um, let it at least be part of my overall uh, trading portfolio. So. First of all, we want to start with the question, what is a blue chip company? And um, there's a story behind this, by the way. Um, so where blue chip comes from, um, we want to start with the classic, um, uh, with the classic um, um, explanation here. A blue chip um, refers to an established, stable, and well-recognized corporation. Companies you might have heard of, um, 3M, for example, or Google, or Alphabet in this context now, the, the parent company. Amazon, American Express, Apple, Bank of America, Coca-Cola, and so on and so forth. So usually you can say, um, as, well, let's let's put it that way. So if you if you look at the uh, thirty companies, for example, which are listed in the Dow Jones, um, you have already a quite good overview of um, classic blue chip companies. But um, the th the interesting thing is more like. Um, Beside the fact that these stocks are seen as relatively safer investments with proven track record of success and stable growth, and having seen uh, periods of, let's say, economic downturns and recessions and, 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 and overcame them and what, what became even stronger over time, the question is more like, why blue? I mean, blue chip, what, what, is, what is the reason for that? And uh, that's a simple reason for that. The story behind the term blue chip refers to casino games, in fact, where blue, white, and red chips are in play, with the blue chips having more value than both red and white chips. And thus, we look at blue chips here in this context and refer to them as blue chip companies because of the highest value in a casino game, in fact. Um, so you can see it's, it's quite quite interesting to, to note that there is um, obviously, at least um, in the lingo, some connection between casino games and trading here. In fact, I probably as a trader would, would say, well, uh, you know, um, there is some characteristics of uh, professional players. So, I mean, there are people out there um, who make a living playing games. That may sound ridiculous because um, is that possible? Yes, it is possible. And in the moment you have an edge and you have a positive expectancy with your overall approach, um, it's possible if you have this edge to probably um, um, 
take an example from blackjack to play blackjack profitably. So it's like, uh, it's, um, um, it's, a, it's a, yeah, it's a game you can have an edge in and make money from. The only problem is that the casino on the other side of the trade, and in this case, or at the other side of, of the game, um, certainly will look for making it difficult for you to make money because there has to be a loser. It's a zero-sum game. Somebody wins, somebody loses. The same is true for trading. So um, in case of trading, um, you're looking for an edge. You have to, to see um, um, where you have an advantage over the other market participants and then capitalize on this advantage. And over time, you see a rising equity curve in this context. And um, so there's to some extent, there's a connection in between and Certainly, you can see that there's also some connections in terms of the used language in this context. So let's now have a look here, as I already mentioned, in fact, um, let's have a look here at the, um, the last bullet point in the slide. So a blue chip stock is generally a component of the most reputable market indices or indexes um, or averages, such as the Dow Jones, as I already mentioned, but also um, when it comes to the S&P 500, when it comes to the NASDAQ 100, so tech um, companies in this context, mostly growth companies then, um, the FTSE 100 in the UK, or in case of Germany, we will talk about uh, the DAX 30, So, uh, which means like uh, Daimler, Volkswagen, or BMW, to name just the big three automobile companies in Germany, they are considered blue chip stocks. And um, so that brings us to the next slide. Um, let me just check again here. Fine. Okay. Um, so now what we want to have a look here is um, what are blue chip characteristics? Um, and uh, based on that, on these characteristics, we then go over and 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 uh, we'll 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 see how this potentially will affect our overall trading um, in general, respectively. What time frame probably to to look at when when trading um, um, stocks in this context? So, blue chips are respectively blue chips have um, in this context, for example. Um, the characteristic that they're seen as less volatile investments because blue chips have an so-called institutional status in the economy. Um, so that being said, means nothing more than that you will see times once the stock moves more aggressive, let's say, or um, 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 it's more volatile. That might be especially the case once you see an earnings release, for example. So recently, um, I think, I'm not sure, Tuesday, Wednesday, this week, for example, Dell um, uh, um, 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 uh, released their earnings. Oh, no, I'm not sure. Did they release their earnings? I'm not sure. No, no, no. I think that was different. Um, I think they sold some part of, of, um, uh, of, of their non-core business, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but whatever reason, there was a pop and then the company or the stock of, the, of, the, um, 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 of Dell here popped up to 100 US dollar. I'm not really sure whether it was an earnings release or it was a, a selling a part of, of, of the business, which was non-core, something like that. Whatever was the reason, there was some action based on this let's say, fundamental game changer, let's call it. And um, in this context, um, what, um, what, we, what, we, uh, what we have here is um, that you need really um, a potential fundamental game changer, which results in elevated volatility, else the company or the stock price in general doesn't move that much. But it's like um, more steady trending if there is a trend at all, some companies don't see um, aggressive moves like you've probably seen in, in companies like Tesla um, recently with a drop below 550, then popping up and then currently about to, to make it up to 800 again, and then moving again $50 on a day um, I'm on the downside. So classic growth um, 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 characteristics or companies, um, or not companies, but stocks which move massively intraday this is something you don't have in blue chips. So which means um, if you do not have these external factors, um, then I probably step away back for, as a trader from um, short-term trades I take in these companies while they are highly liquid as we've seen here or as we will see now in this bullet point. So these, these companies are highly liquid due to their status, due to their market capitalization, and certainly due to the fact that they are still actively traded and there is some, um, some, some moving in and out of, of these stocks. But the thing is um, that 
the fact that they are mostly traded by institutional investors um, and, and individuals alike also, but with due to the massive volume you have, um, which which is um, usually um, um, connected directly to these blue chip companies, what you have is then that it's. In, let's put this in quotation marks, but it's difficult to move the stock and to let it trend. Um, so really like on an intraday basis and, and then see a strong move in one or the other direction. I'm not saying that's impossible, but there are certainly, let's say, easier ways to profit from such intraday swings, um, um, let's put it, put it this um, way. And uh, there's probably some, yeah, I, I wouldn't say low float stocks. It's probably another extreme on the other side, but um, at least it's something um, to consider if, if you're looking for um, I'm trading actively on an intraday uh, from an intraday perspective that blue chips are not that interesting for traders who are looking let's call it for action or biggest swings intraday it's not impossible but you certainly need a trigger event from an external um, aspect to see larger chunks of money being pumped into the stock respectively being taken out of the stock to see some trending um, happening then and then you certainly have opportunities to trade also from a from a short-term perspective but blue chips are usually companies or stocks investments here which are um, more aiming on longer term investment goals let's say that's probably a fair way to put it um, blue chip companies this is another characteristic which is um of high importance in this context, they have little to no debt. So some, I, we could also call it, um, they have a very solid balance sheet in this context. They have a large market capitalization, usually greater than f 5 billion. So <laughs> that being said, you might now say, well, wow, then, then uh, we should certainly consider um, um, Coinbase, which I mentioned to have a market cap with the first print um, uh, here on um, Wednesday uh, with a market cap of over 100 billion. That's certainly true then in this context that this company is a blue chip then. Well, probably it can establish rather sooner than later a role within the um, overall um, market so that we can say, well, we have, um, uh, by the way, just a question um, in this context. So did you did you trade the IPO in Coinbase? Or if, if you didn't trade it, um, had, did you have it on your agenda? If, if you want, um, just um, type it into the chat box um, um, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in, in the YouTube channel. If you're watching this on the recording now, probably you can post also a comment below the video. And then in this context, um, um, give your experiences with the trading of this. But I'm um, also here within this um, um, live event now, if, if just give me, give me an idea of um, um, if you at least watch the um, IPO and what were your thoughts on this, that would be probably of interest. Um, but let's come back to the to the uh, large market cap. So usually this is something which is of interest here, um, and and something which is um, uh, to be considered, which is already giving you an idea also on um, why, for example, market participants traders were so excited about the developments. For example, in GameStop, uh, late January, respectively, in Triple B Y, is a company which just released earnings. By the way, not so good earnings, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but also AMC, for example, and uh, these companies. Um, for example, a GameStop had a market cap um, before this vertical move, um, and it shot up to to uh, like double digit um, um, billion market cap uh, regions. Um, that it, the, the company GameStop had a had a market cap of below one billion before that, which already explaining how such a massive squeeze could have have happened because this is something you usually do not expect to see um, in a blue chip um, usually usually because for example I could give you another example Volkswagen in 2008 for example um, uh, shot up to 1,000 um, euro per share uh, due to um, uh, some rumors back then in uh, in a, in a um, um, acquisition from Porsche so it's not um, it's, it's not um, impossible, but at least something um, to, to, to take into uh, account here. Usually this is not happening in blue chip companies. And um, so then they have also another important aspect when you look at blue chip companies and fundamentals in this context, stable debt to equity ratio. So which means you have um, uh, here um, 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 a param parameter or a number which tells you the company's total liabilities dividend by its shareholder equity in this context, for example. Um, you also have a high return on equity, which is um, something we refer to in the fundamentals of a, of, a, of a stock here of a company as ROI. 
E, net income dividend by shareholders equity, and for example, also return on assets here, which means um, ROA, it's a net income dividend by the original capital cost of the investment, or if you want the higher the ratio, to put this in perspective, to get an idea on what this means, the higher the ratio, the greater the benefit earned here for your investment. And um, so while dividend payments are not absolutely necessary uh, for a stock to be considered a blue chip, um, most blue chip um, companies here have long records of paying stable or rising dividends. This is something, this is what we refer to as dividend aristocrats. To just give them um, um, a final um, um, a thought here on this, what I mean if I say a blue chip company does not necessarily need to pay um, a dividend. Amazon, for example, certainly a blue chip company does not pay a dividend. Just um, to, to, to give an idea um, on, on what blue chip companies do not pay dividends, for example, Amazon is, is one of these. Um, <clears throat> But let's come back to the dividend aristocrats. There's also an article um, on, on uh, let me just, by the way, I'm just copy paste the link here in the chat box. One second, please. Let me just see. So, um, dividend aristocrat. For those watching this on YouTube, uh, you find the link here um, uh, in the description box, okay? So let me just check here. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so let's now have a look here at on how to trade blue chip companies. You already have an idea um, when I, what, 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 what's the time I consider um, a blue chip company to be of interest for me. Um, so from a trading perspective, sometimes earnings which are massively um, 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 overwhelmingly good or massively under expectation from the street and potentially causing potential sell-off, um, then blue chip companies tend to uh, uh, be of interest for me. But most of the time, I look at blue chips from a longer term time frame, longer term perspective in this context. And um, so that brings us to the first bullet point. The classic way here is certainly to invest respectively trade equity indices like the Dow Jones, S&P or DAX. Um, if you want not just to invest, but also to trade it actively. So probably um, um, we have to take out invest here first. So um, if I want to um, if I want to 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 trade blue chips, um, what I do is I usually trade a basket of these blue chips. A basket of these blue chips is nothing more than an index like the Dow, like the S and P five hundred, or especially the DAX. In my case, so I'm located in Berlin, in Germany, so my main focus is um, certainly on the DAX. And if I want to trade blue chips. I trade the DAX, in fact. So I'm heavily trading blue chips, but I'm more trading the DAX. And this, this is very interesting here in this context, given the overall structure the DAX delivers. So the DAX is um, compared to the um, quite liquid. Yeah, I think that's a fair way to put it. Um, so with lots of market depth and 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 also um, 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 also from a from a from a from a, from a liquidity perspective in general. Um, the S&P 500 is deeper, far more deeper than the DAX, which means that the DAX tends to overshoot um, and shows intraday, at least, um, some heavier swings in relation to the overall index reading. It's not as stable. And so it's um, not it, it's, it's possible, but not that common. So there's more kind of an erratic structure uh, in the in the DAX. So there's no, no such thing as clear, steady, clean trends, at least not intraday. So if you look at it from a longer term perspective, you can certainly see these trends developing. But from an intraday perspective, it's not uncommon that you see aggressive swings on the up or downside, which can then certainly, based on um, 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 a trading approach, can be traded profitably. But all in all, um, uh, it's it's um, from from its from its um, um, yeah from its swing perspective here it's more um, uh, it, it's more attractive for traders um, it, especially in the short term environment and this is something we could refer to as trading blue chips in fact um, if you plan to invest here in 
blue chips um, or in an index, then we will certainly have to have a look at ETFs, which are focusing on it on exactly that. But um, in case of trading, again, to, to finalize that thought, um, it's that traders certainly appreciate the aspect of blue chip companies and their stocks to be highly liquid. This is the next thing. So while at one hand, so the DAX is like, um, sometimes it, it makes really fun to trade it, but sometimes it's just um, annoying and too erratic because, um, and this is the question of liquidity, the, the lower the liquidity, the more aggressive the overshoots on the up and then on the downside. And um, so the DAX is most of the time interesting to trade, but sometimes it's also, it's just too much, especially when it, um, when, 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 when volatility dries out um, before of, um, for example, holiday season or something like that, so Christmas or whatever. And um, then you still get sometimes some aggressive pops on the up or downside, given the fact that then there's a, a trigger moment once, they, once the market um, um, hits a certain threshold and then starts to break out aggressively, being sold aggressively later once, uh, later um, again, but still that, that this is sometimes... Um, yeah, sometimes difficult to trade because there these 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 spikes are very aggressive, and in addition to that, there's also slippage, which is becoming an issue. For example, making it difficult to trade this profitably from a longer perspective. But um, coming back to blue chips, um, so the aspect that it's highly liquid means nothing more than you have very tight spreads, um, and you have in this context always a very good um, not just from a from a um, um, cost perspective, but also from a trading perspective, great way to calculate your risk reward in a very adequate way. So put it differently. I mean, if you have a, I mean, there's a very aggressive um, example talking about low float stocks in this context. So where it's uh, less than, than 10 million shares outstanding, which can be traded and where you can with a, with a um, leveraged account, sometimes significantly up to the complete float of, of this, of this company. But um, the thing is that in this context, sometimes you probably spot a setup. And the question now is, is this really um, a profitable setup because if I assume that my risk is, let's say, $1, but at the end, um, this is just um, a print on the chart, which is just resulting out of a trade which was done there, but does not necessarily mean that there's enough liquidity available at that level so that I can really exit the trade if I'm wrong on my idea. Then the problem is that your risk reward may not be as favorable as you might have guessed before entering the trade. And this is something which is um, um, really minimized when trading blue chips due to the fact that there is such a high liquid um, environment in which you find yourself and with all the market participants focusing on these stocks and having them on their agenda. And um, so now let's look at the longer term perspective from trading to more investment and where I focus on, on blue chips. So longer term investments, um, investors will potentially and especially look for attractive dividend stocks in which they can invest in two ways, in fact. So first, through mutual funds, such as index funds or exchange traded funds. So I, I in this context, um, um, say mutual funds are, in my personal definition, classic index funds, uh, while exchange traded funds, so-called ETFs, um, are far more attractive from, from a... From a, um, uh, from a cost perspective, especially. And also given the possibility when it comes to um, um, placing your orders, for example, working with stops in this case. Um, so exchange traded funds really deliver the opportunity for you to invest in a broad index of blue chip companies. For example, here in this context, the EUDV, this is the um, ETF. You can also find um, 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 on the website from Admirals here in this context and when it comes to these dividend aristocrat stocks. So if you say, well, this is a nice idea um, because I'm looking for an investment in a solid ETF in this context, so broader diversification, many blue chip companies. Um, and here in this context, we are looking obviously at stocks um, or companies in this case, which are um, paying a dividend and it's a stable, respectively, a reliable source of income in addition to the aspect that it's also rising over time. So they, they, they really look for um, increasing the dividend over time and um, um, pay a higher um, dividend over time to their investors, long-term investors. And in this context, for example, the uh, Spider Euro Dividend Aristocrats use its ETF, probably of, of higher interest. And um, so this is also a very interesting way, in fact, um, then 
buying the stocks individually, like buying just an Exxon Mobile or AT&T. There's no um, coincidence that I mentioned these two because these are classic aristocrats um, here, dividend aristocrats. Um, but what you, what you can also um, have a look here is that holding a position over a date when a dividend is paid will result in so-called cash adjustments reflecting the weighted effect of dividend payouts, meaning that your account will be credited the dividend amount, which is um, paid. And um, then the stock price will also drop, offsetting the dividend amount per share. So it's not that you invest in a company, let's say, uh, let's say the, the company um, has a, has a I don't know, stock price of 100 US dollar, let's say, and you invest in a company, the company pays a dividend of, let's say, five euros uh, per share or five USD per share, um, and, and your, your stock price stays at 100. But it's more like you get then, let's say you have 100 shares, you get paid 500 US dollar, um, while also the investment is dropping, the stock price is dropping by five USD that a special date um, at, at the date when the dividend is paid. So just not that you that you that you misunderstand that. But all in all, um, and this is exactly what, what you're aiming on. It's like you invest in the company and your target is in fact longer term to position yourself and generate a cash flow you can comfortably live from, in fact. So it's like um, becoming financially independent. That's the target when you invest, especially in blue chip companies and in this context in companies which pay a reliable increasing dividend, which will pay your rent, whatever. Um, and so in case of the of the uh, EU, E U D V. Um, so this this dividend aristocrat um, in this case for the European sector. Um, what I have here is um, an idea on where we have our top ten holdings in this context. So um, as you can see, this is this is from a German website. It's Finanzen.net, um, and Zonsi is um, all the others. So what you have here is uh, the top ten holdings, which make up little less than 50% of the overall um, uh, universe this ETF is investing in. And as you can see here, we have um, Allianz, for example, big German company. Um, we have uh, Bayer, there's also a German company, Deutsche Post, Siemens, um, Münchner Rück, this is um, 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 an insurance company, an insurance company for insurance companies, in fact. Um, and um, then other, this is as, as I already said, so you can see here Total, for example, or a Fortune, or what we have here, EDP, and Energias de Portugal, so obviously also Portuguese stocks here, and, and this the um, um, energy sector in Portugal. Um, so you have plenty of these companies which are as you may have guessed, I mean, what well, we could certainly um, look up now other technical indicators, but what you can find here in case of Allianz or in case of Deutsche Post or Siemens especially, these are not companies um, you see move that much on an intraday basis. So you can certainly see over time some kind of capital appreciation and capital growth once you invest in them. But usually these stocks do not move heavily but they are quite stable. Certainly there's times when volatility uh, really picks up like last year, COVID-19 pandemic hitting lockdown and all that stuff. And certainly also we had chances to see a drop of 5% uh, in, a, in a Siemens, for example. So German um, 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 uh, um, company here, which is usually moving, let's say something up to 1%. And then we have a strong move intraday. Um, and so this is this is something which is, which is um, certainly then perfectly illustrating already that you're really aiming on the dividend payments and the stable capital growth, respectively, um, um, preservance in this context here and not see much heavy, uh, aggressive moves, volatility based. But this is something which is um, looking for the longer term picture. And now what we want to do is um, we now want to want to uh, give some some uh, key metrics when looking at dividend stocks. So certainly the first aspect is like, well, this is great. I mean, what I have to look up is uh, the company with the highest dividend yield and uh, then take it from there. So the dividend yield is the annualized dividend, which is represented as a percentage of the stock price. For example, stock trades at $20 with a company paying $1 dividend per year annualized. So that means that the dividend yield is 
hmm, that sounds that sounds interesting. The only problem is that the dividend yield itself is not necessarily um, a good metric, or it shouldn't be considered a good metric alone in this context. But there's other um, components which you sh which you have to take into uh, account. For example, the payout ratio. So the dividend as a percentage of a company's earnings, which means if a company, for example, earns one dollar per share, so the EPS earnings per share in net income, while paying let's say fifty cent dividend per share, well the payout ratio is fifty percent, which is generally speaking. Um, you could say, well, the lower this payout ratio, the more sustainable a dividend should be, because it should be clear that a company needs to make this $1 per share earnings first, and then it can pay. And there's no real room, let's say, now to make investments, to um, somehow look to, to, to improve your overall business, whatever. But it's like you pay out um, the, uh, um, um, the investors in this context. Why do you do that? Well, there's certain reasons that probably you have a very um, prosperous, let's say, outlook for the overall company and the business model. Probably it's because uh, you need uh, to to um, uh, keep your investors um, happy and then want to have want to make sure that they stay. And sometimes you probably say, OK, I pay more than I probably could to attract and keep these um, 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 investors for a longer perspective, just to hope that they don't jump the ship, take their money and, and uh, move other um, uh, move somewhere else. And um, so this is something which, which should be taken into account. So a too high payout ratio here in this context might look interesting at first glance, but it's not necessarily at second glance. So then we have the earnings per share. It's also a very important metric to, to consider when you look at dividend stocks. So roughly speaking, we could say that the best dividend stocks here are companies that have shown the ability to regularly, like, I'm sorry, regularly grow earnings per share over time and thus raise the dividend, dividend aristocrats, as we already mentioned. Um, and the history of earnings growth is often evidence of durable competitive advantages. So this is a very good sign here. Um, which is um, um, usually, yeah, also building trust over time and thus um, building a long-term business relationship, which is exactly what you do once you invest in a company. And then I would always look at it from a, from a business perspective in this case. And then we have also certainly another um, very important key metric, the so-called PE ratio. You probably have heard about this, um, the price to earnings ratio, which divides a company's share price into earnings per shares. And the PE ratio is um, a metric here that can be used along with dividend yields to determine if a dividend stock is fairly well valued. So which means like if you have a very high PE ratio here, for example, price to earnings, um, and you have a too high dividend yield, then probably probably your earnings have to pick up first, which makes it not that likely that the company can continue to pay these high dividends over time. And probably there will be an adaptation over time and there will be a drop in the dividend being paid. So this is, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So it, it has to be a good mix, let's say, a good mix of all these um, key metrics here, which will give you... Um, um, a solid chance to invest with a solid company here and profit from the overall dividend outlook for the company. So that brings us directly to high dividend yield blue chips. And um, so what we should usually do is in fact, we should look here, we should, or not we should look for, but we what we should try to avoid, let's put it that way, um, we should uh, try to avoid the so-called dividend yield trap, um, which means we shouldn't invest in a stock only by looking at the dividend yield, as I already pointed out, um, since high dividend yield is probably the result of for example, a massive drop in the stock price, for example, which is usually a sign of trouble. So, or we, we put it differently. I mean, um, just look at the massive drop in stock prices one year ago, 12 months ago. So we have April 21. So in April 2020, uh, we, we had the COVID-19 pandemic hitting, stocks being under massive pressure. And certainly a company um, had to focus on other aspects than to um, think about how to, um, how this, 
developments will um, affect their, their dividend payments, which means there probably hasn't been some kind of, of um, um, adaptation being made, which means the dividend yield for some blue chip companies shot through the roof. Um, and this is certainly something which um, you should take into account. That's a positive example, let's put it that way. Um, the negative example is that there is probably a company which is probably, I don't know, investigated by the SEC for whatever business practices, what, whatever it might be. Um, and there's a massive drop in the stock price because the um, um, trust in the company and the board of directors, whoever, is dropping massively, which means if the stock price drops now, while the dividend stays the same, certainly the dividend yield shoots up, but it's certainly a sign that you should really think twice before investing your money with such a company, even though it might look at first glance that it has a very attractive dividend yield or is paying a dividend yield, which is above um, average in this case. So in this context, carefully um, look at the payout ratios here. Ah, okay, I'm just, I'm just, I was just curious, but I have no, no extra slide. I was just like wondering, I, I promised at the beginning to, to share my top three. And then I, I thought that I forgot the slide, but no, no, it's, uh, it's at, at the end of this slide now. Um, so um, uh, carefully look at the payout ratios, which helps to gauge the uh, dividends sustainability. Okay. Um, look at the company's dividend history, the payout growth and yield. And in general, when you plan to invest longer term, look at companies and their balance sheet, um, which means take into account their debt, their cash, other assets and liabilities in this context. And um, so, which means that, oh, wait, wait, sorry, here. So, um, which, which means that it's not just focusing on one company, but it's probably more, um, makes more sense to also have a look at the in industry in general. So at the competition in this, um, in this space, potential weak demand, which could come from wherever, um, potential disruptions. This is all something which starts to play a role right now. Right now, everyone is going crazy about um, the developments in the stock market. The question is, what is real and, and what is sustainable of this move? And what's more like yeah, purely liquidity driven by the massive injections um, from central banks in terms of liquidity. So, I mean, and we could certainly say that, for example, electric vehicles, I mean, this is a perfect example to some extent. I'm a big fan of, of Tesla, right? Well, I mean, it's not that I, that I do not see um, uh, this, this, this massive evaluation in this case when looking at the PE ratio, but it's a growth company. So it doesn't make sense to really look at the, at the PE ratio in this context, even though, I mean, if that once it, it shot above 1000 was kind of crazy, but then well, I say, well, mm, Let's have a look at it from a different perspective. Is, is it really only electric vehicles or it's more like um, a company which also delivers service around electric vehicles, charging uh, stations, whatever. So, I mean, there's, there's probably so much potential, especially probably when looking at China. I, I, I think um, um, Tesla is one of the, yeah, biggest competitors in the Chinese markets for their direct Chinese competitors like Neo, Li, XPath. And we, we talked about this in a, in a recent um, Hot Topic webinar about this stuff. Um, and now still, I wonder, well, if I look at it from an electric vehicle perspective, and still it's a, it's a car company, right? And they're building cars and they're selling cars. Well, we have a stay-at-home attitude, at least. I mean, probably this is this is something um, um, where my 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 current heuristics or um, um, let's say my cognitive bias plays an important role because here in Germany things are a little different than in other parts of the world right now because we plan to shut down everything. So certainly this somehow affects my overall um, um, view on the whole situation. But the question is then, well, can they really? Can they really sell that many cars if everyone is starting to focus on um, staying at home? Why do I need a, a car um, which 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 um, um, brings me to my to my uh, workspace if I work from home? So that's a simple question. Now you might say, well, that's probably true when looking at classic cars, but not necessarily at electric vehicles. But still, I could imagine this to somehow impact our overall. Um, let's call it consumption behavior in this context. So um, especially also when looking at the price for, for such a car. I mean, um, it's, it's like they're, they're right now focusing more and more on building, let's call it cheaper cars and cheaper cars in terms of um, um, lower prices and in the mid-class segment, let's say. But still, I consider prices for such a car to be elevated, at least when looking at um, what do I need the car for? 
it's more most of the time most likely it's to probably um go on vacation and that's 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 the only thing right now because again i'm at home i'm working from home home office attitude so taking this into account this is something which is also then um, making you wonder should make you wonder um is the overall outlook for the company still given and it's a it's a growth sector in which you find yourself in or which has a, a prosperous outlook let's call it i mean it's a difficult example because tesla is not paying a dividend so that is a difficult, difficult um, 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 take here. But just to give you some thoughts on how your thinking could um, 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 could be uh, could, could could go here, and what you what you could ask yourself in this context, and um, so that brings us now to the um, top three. In fact, so usually let's introduce this. Usually, blue chip companies avoid the dividend yield trap by definition. In fact. Um, else they wouldn't be considered a blue chip company. So by definition, a blue chip company is usually um, a good pick when you look at dividends. And the average blue chip dividend yield um, you can find in the US space, in this case, in US equities, lies between 2 to 6%. And that being said, brings us to my personal top three dividend yield blue chip stocks. Um, in this context, it's at and It's a dividend yield of 6.8%. Altria, it's 7.72% and it's IBM 5.32%. So these three companies are um, definitely worth to give it a deeper look once you plan to invest, to diversify your portfolio and, and to think about um, where, if, you, if you're currently thinking about, I want to diversify my portfolio, I want to diversify it by attractive dividend stocks to generate a certain cash flow. Um, and in this context, I consider these three um, uh, of interest at least, and, and then give it a deeper look and see whether it fits my overall investment perspective or investment style, if this is um, what I want to, to um, let be part of my, of my overall um, um, portfolio, investment portfolio. So, and um, that brings us to the summary. Let me just um, check out here. Okay. Um, so let's have a look at today's summary. So first of all, blue ship refers to an established, stable, and well-recognized corporation. 3M, Alphabet, Google, Amazon, American Express, Apple, Bank of America, Coca-Cola, AT&T, Altria, IBM, um, and blue chips are seen as relatively safer investments with a proven track record of success and stable growth. The classic way is certainly um, to invest trade equity indices like the Dow, S&P, in my case, especially the DAX. So you could consider this trading blue chips. That's at least the way I look at it when trading the DAX in this context. But Longer term investors will potentially and especially look for attractive dividend um, um, stocks and dividend yields, which are being paid here, um, not looking at it from a trading perspective due to, yeah, liquidity is positive in this context, but also means the, the more liquid a stock is, the less likely it is to move stronger, especially intraday. Um, if you do not have an external catalyst, which is moving the stock then in one or the other direction. And the top three I presented to you were at and Altria and IBM in this context, and uh, yeah, these are these are my these are my top three um, dividend yield stocks. The next webinar will take place on Wednesday next week, and uh, let me just go over directly. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me just see. Uh, can we? Let me just see. Can I? Can I open? Where we have it? One second, please. One second. One second. One second. I have to open the top here, which I can then present to you, but unfortunately it does not open. But this brings us, before we start here, this brings us to the fact, um, if you watch this now on YouTube, again, if you just enjoyed what you saw, uh, please leave a thumb up here. If you have any comments, any questions, any suggestions, anything I didn't um, answer. Also, um, probably an answer to uh, the question whether you had the uh, Coinbase IPO on your agenda. Please feel free to share um, your thoughts here also in the description box below the video. Leave a thumb up here. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, uh, set a reminder for the um, upcoming webinar, which, by the way, will also be streamed um, here on YouTube. Why? 
one second. So we have here the educations tab and there is the webinars. And there you can register first, but also you can, again, watch this then on YouTube here. It will be again with me. <laughs> so we will focus, in fact, on another um, hot IPO, recent IPO, the Roblox IPO. And um, in this context, onto the question, which gaming stocks are hot? Video game stocks, stay at home. Well, we had it. So uh, that's probably also a quite hot sector right now. And um, something to, uh, um, to, take, to take into account here in this context. Um, so this is what we want to focus here next Wednesday at uh, 2 p.m. London again, so 4 p.m. Eastern European time. And so now we head over again here to the presentation. So for, oh, no, 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 that's the wrong slide. So here, for um, further information, please check out um, the website, admirals.com, send an email, um, YouTube channel, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Facebook, um, you can, you can find admirals everywhere, I think. And uh, so that's that's now the last slide with the risk disclaimer. Um, I wish you all the best. Happy trading. Watch your stops. Talk to you again then on Wednesday again on the Roblox IPO and after the Roblox IPO, which potential stocks could be hot now in the video gaming sector here too. And uh, that's it from my end. So all the best. Happy trading. See your stop. See you and bye-bye.